Father in heaven, we thank you because you love us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has died for each and every one of us. We thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to listen to your word. We want to commit all our viewers from wherever they are, the Lord, you may shower them with your blessing. The presence of your Holy Spirit may minister upon them for glorification and honor of your name. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So we want to welcome you back to our study session. And yesterday we were looking at the topic, where is your heart? And we happen to see that in our world today, many people are affected by materialism and consumerism, whereby we focus our attention and our minds upon the things of the world. And the Bible clearly told us, as we saw yesterday, that when we love the world and the things of the world, then the love of God is not in us. And if the love of God is not in us, ours is to perish and to be doomed. And we happen to see that this is the desire of the devil, that God's people to set their hearts upon the things of the world, that they may forget about the great things that God has done for them, and that becomes idolatry in our lives. For today, we are going to study about where is your love? Where is your love? And as we are looking upon this subject, we are going to meditate from the book of Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 23. Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 23. And we are going to study about where is your love. So kindly, together with me, let us turn to our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 18, beginning from verse 18. And the Bible reads, now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments? Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Today we are going to study where is your love. And we are going to see that when we love something, we invest in what we love. We invest on the person we love. We invest on the things we love. We invest on the things that we enjoy doing in our lives. And so this young man was very rich. And apart from being rich, he was also a ruler. And in his life, he felt that there's an emptiness in him. And he was in a quest to find satisfaction in whatever he was finding in life. So one day he decided to come to Jesus and ask him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? For this rich young man, eternal life entailing doing something he, he understood that you have to do something. You have to work for your salvation. And it's in, in this quest that because he felt that an, there's an emptiness in his life, he decides to come to Jesus to find a solution to the problem that he had. Because according to him, he had done everything that was pertained to salvation, but he still felt that there's an empty thing in his life so he decides to come to Jesus and ask Jesus, what should I do? What must I do? Is there anything which I'm lacking in my life in order to inherit eternal life? Remember in John 3, 16, the Bible says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So this man was looking for eternal life. 
but he was looking for eternal life in the wrong place. But the good news is that he came to the right person, and that's Jesus Christ. He came to Jesus seeking for eternal life, and eternal life is obtained through Jesus Christ. When we believe in the Son of God, and that's Jesus Christ our Lord. But the interesting thing about Jesus Christ when he was here on earth, while we were with his disciples, most of the time he did not call them to believe in him, but he called them to follow him. Jesus wanted the disciples to experience who he was, that they can be able to learn who Jesus Christ is. And from learning from Jesus Christ, they can be able to learn what it means to be saved. And by that, they can develop their faith. So Jesus Christ told his disciples, follow me. And most of his disciples followed Jesus Christ. A good example is Matthew, who was a tax collector. One day when he was sitting at his tax booth, when Jesus saw him, he called him and told him, follow me. It's very interesting. Matthew being a tax collector, he may have been rich. And, having, and the life that the tax collectors were living, it was not a good life. And they were never liked by the people around. And so Matthew decides to leave his probation. He leaves his job and follows Jesus Christ. But when you look at this man, the Christ could have given him a direct answer. My friend, if you want to get internal life, follow me. But Jesus Christ realized that this answer will not help this young man. And he decides to, to, to help him, to assist him, to understand what it means to have internal life by telling him, if you want to have life, keep the commandments. And so Jesus Christ was trying to direct the young man to what he was lacking in his life, and that what was missing, it was love. He was missing love for humanity, and he was missing love for God. And with that, the young man said that he had kept all the commandments since he was a young boy, since he was a young person, since he was a child. But he still felt a sense of emptiness in his life. And because of that, he asked Jesus, what thing do I lack? Because I've kept the commandment. Is there any other thing that I need to do in order to have eternal life? And then Jesus Christ decided to hit the nail on the head by telling him, you still want, lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. So Jesus Christ was trying to tell him that to go and destroy the empire that he had acquired, to go and destroy the world that he had acquired and follow Jesus Christ. It was not easy for this young man to make this choice. It was not easy. Unlike Matthew, who was a tax collector, when he felt that I need to be saved and he saw the Savior, he left everything and followed Jesus Christ. He did not need to start believing in Jesus, but he decided to follow Jesus. And by following Jesus, he came to believe in Jesus. So it's the same experience that uh, another, another person had, and that's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And at this time, he had heard about Jesus Christ. And he decides to look for him when he heard that Jesus Christ is passing by Jericho. And when he met Jesus, Jesus told him, come down for I'm going to your house. It's very interesting the way Jesus Christ calls people to discipleship. At one time, this man, he tells him, go and sell all that you have and then you follow me. But with Zacchaeus, he told him, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to your house today. And you know what happened to the life of Zacchaeus? He was very much happy. He was very much excited because the Savior had come to his house. And that day, Zacchaeus decided to sell all, a half of his property to distribute to the poor. And anybody that he had robbed, he returned to that person four times. And that day, clearly Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. For this man, Zacchaeus, was a son of Abraham. He was lost, but he has been found. 
But for the rich young ruler, it was difficult. It was very hard to sell what he had. And that's what Jesus Christ pointed to the problem that he had in his life. His problem was the material wealth that he had. The quest for wealth, the quest for material possession had made it be, to become an idol for his life. And, it, and he forgot about his spiritual life. Though he, 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 he used to worship God, though he used to offer sacrifices, though he used to bring offerings to church or to the synagogue or wherever he went to worship, he still felt that there is a void inside him. And that was because God was not in his life. God was, his, was not his number one. His material possession was his first in his life. The interesting thing about this young man is that he had struggled to acquire this possession. He had not stolen from anybody. He had not squandered from or obtained the material possession wrongfully, but he had struggled. He had sweat to acquire this possession. But it's very interesting that he had, he had placed all his heart, all his soul upon the material possession that he had acquired. And that became a stumbling block between his life and his God. And that's what brought a void in him. And this, it made him not to be happy. He was not happy with the life that he was living. He looked for something greater in his life. And that's why he decided to come and ask Jesus what he needed to do. But the mistake about him is that he believed that he has to work everything. He has to do in order to please God. He believed that he has to do something in order to obtain favor with God. But that's not the grace of God. The grace of God has been given freely. It has been given without measure. You don't need to do anything. You just need to accept it. And that's why we see Jesus Christ was ready to go and dine and dwell together with Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus had accepted the grace of God which was working in his life. We too could be living in a similar manner of life whereby we are born and bred in church. We have lived in the church. We know everything about the church and the church, it's, it's all about our life and our lifestyle. But still, we could not be having the Savior. Still, the grace of God, we have not accepted it. Still, we are empty, just like this rich young ruler. And so, when he came to Jesus and asked for a way out, Jesus Christ pointed him to what he needed to do, to dispose of what was blocking him, what was preventing him from meeting with the Lord. Instead of Christ telling him, follow me, he tells him, Go and sell all that you have. Give them to the poor. And then come and follow me. Because when you do that, you will store up your treasure in heaven. It's very hard to give if your heart is in your wealth. If you love what you have more than the Lord Jesus Christ. For this young man, he loved his possession more than he loved his God. And that's why it was hard for him to let go of his material possession. It was very hard for him to distribute it to the poor. And it's very interesting that the Lord did not tell him to go and bring it to the church, but he told him to go and give them to the poor. Those who do not work, those who have not worked, those whom sometimes they are being perceived that they have not toiled to acquire. Those who, who, who don't have, who are not privileged. And so this is where his problem was. He had no love for humanity. And Jesus Christ told him to express, to show his love for others by telling him to sell all that he had in order to come to Jesus Christ. For us to be God's children, we have to count the cost of our discipleship. When you look at the book of Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14 verse 33, the Bible says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that 
he has cannot be my disciple. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to count the cost of discipleship. And if you can't count the cost of following Jesus, you will not be a follower of Jesus Christ. You will not be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can be a Christian, but not a follower of Jesus Christ. A true Christian is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in our world today, there are many Christians, but we have few disciples of Jesus Christ. And this was the problem with this young man. He was, he, 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 he professed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He professed to be a believer of God, but he was not a follower of God. And that's why Christ pointed him to the right direction, whereby he needed to remove what was becoming in, in between him and the Lord so that he can be free to follow the Lord without any hindrances. And that's why the Lord told him, go and sell all that you have, then come and follow me. Because when you do that, you will store up treasure in heaven for yourself. And that's why Jesus Christ said, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. There is something which is blocking or preventing you from following Jesus Christ in your life. And that's becoming a stumbling block between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Lord is calling us to forsake these things which comes in between us and the Lord. Because when you forsake them, we become free. We become at liberty to worship and praise the Lord and honor his name. And in our world today, there are many things which are in the world which have engrossed our minds. They have engrossed our attention. They have taken our love for God from us. And so we have loved these things and the love of God is not in us because we have cherished the things of the world and thereby they have become an idol for us in our Christian walk of life. What do you spend more of your time in doing than in the word of God? Like in our world today, we find that most of us, we love watching football. We spend much of our time in sports activity and many other games in order to entertain ourselves rather than spending time in the word of God. You will find that there is somebody who knows how much a player earns, how much, how much wealth he has, how much property. He knows about his wife, his siblings, or even his girlfriends. He, we know more about other personalities. We more, know more about other sportsmen and other celebrities, about their lifestyle and how they live more than God. And these are the things which have come in between us and God. And that's what we find today, most of our young people, we spend a lot of money in betting. And it's not only even the young people, even the older people, the adults, the men, and the women, the older men, those who have grown old, and even the older women, they are spending much of their money in betting. But you'll find them, it's very hard to bring of whatever they have earned to the house of God. It becomes difficult for them to give to us God's cause, but it's easy for them to bet. It's easy for them to gamble. It's easy for them to spend whatever God has blessed them for other other pleasures which are in the world. We could be in the church, but our hearts, our love for the things of the world is not, is so supreme in our lives than our love for God. How much time do we spend for the love of worldly music? How much time do we spend for the love of worldly entertainment than the study of the word of God? These are the things which have come in between us and God. We have spent much more in fashion and investing in, in, in the fashion industry than in the word of God. We have spent more in the things of the world, in acquiring more property and the things of the world than spending more in the cause of God. And that's why there is a separation between us and the disciples of God. 
And so Jesus Christ is calling us. Jesus Christ is calling you and me to look upon the things which have come in between us and God that we may surrender all, that we may lose all those things for the cost, for the cost of the gospel, for the cost of the kingdom. And that's why Jesus Christ says that if you're not ready to lose all, if you're not ready to surrender all, then you'll not be able to inherit eternal life. And this became hard for this rich young man. It was hard because he didn't count the cost of discipleship. He didn't count the cost of discipleship. So what is the cost of discipleship? There are four, four key things that we need to look before we consider ourselves as disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You need to introspect into your life these four key things. The first one, for you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, first you have to repent, then believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. When you look at the book of Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 15. This is the first statement that Jesus used when he began to his preaching ministry. And he said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. For us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to repent of our sins. We need to acknowledge ourselves that we have sinned and gone against the will of God. We need to recognize that we have stolen from God. We need to recognize that we have not used of the blessings that God has put at, at our custody. We have not used wisely what God has put in our hands. We need to recognize that we have become bad stewards and repent from the wrongs that you have done and turn away. Because when you repent, we, we become remorseful of how unfaithful stewards we have been and turn away from those habits. And when we do so, we need to believe in the gospel. You know, sometimes we want to believe in the gospel. We want to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings salvation. But we don't want to turn away from our sins. And this is the problem of the Laudation Church, the church of the last days. This church of the last days, it wants to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it does, it does not want to repent. It does not want to turn away from their sins. We want to be called children of God, but we want to remain with the things of the world at our, in our closets. We want to enjoy the things of the world while calling ourselves to be Christians. And so the Bible is calling us to live and forsake the things of the world. Leave them. And then when you do so, we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings salvation. And through this gospel, it will give us the power. It will give us the power to surrender all to Jesus. It will give us the power to overcome. It will give us the power to live according to the will of God. And so the second item that we need to do in, the, in our quest to, be, to count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is to abide in the word of God. Abide in the word of God. When you look at the book of John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus Christ is speaking to the Jews and many other people who had believed in him. They had believed because they had, decided, they had seen that there's something different about Jesus Christ and like any other teachers who had lived before. And so Jesus Christ tells them, then Jesus said to those Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Remember in the course of this week, we had read that man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that comes from the mouth of God. So for us as God's children, for us to be steadfast, for us to be firm in our Christian walk of life, we need to abide in, our, in the word of God. The word of God should come alive in us. And the word of God should be our rule of our life. 
And if we don't live by the word of God, then we indeed will not become disciples of God. It will be difficult for us to follow Jesus Christ if we don't abide in his word. And that's why Jesus Christ told his disciples that I'm going to leave you an helper, a comforter. He will teach you, he will remind you of the things that I've told you. So the Holy Spirit was not going to remind his, his disciples, he was not going to, tell, to teach his disciples new things, but it was going to remind the disciples of the things that they had learned from the Lord Jesus Christ. So for us to be sustained as God's people, as God's children, we need to abide in his word. And so it's very much difficult for many to abide in God's word because they hardly have time to study the word of God. They hardly have time to introspect what is God talking about, what is God saying, what is God talking to them in these last days. And that's why you find that though this rich young ruler was professing to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and he may have known the, the truth of the word of God, but he was not abiding in the word of God. And that's why we see him saying that, I've kept all these commandments since I was a child. But this commandment that he's saying that he has kept them, it was a mechanical keeping of the commandment of God. And I remember in the course of this week, the preacher told us that, by thinking that I've kept this commandment and I've kept this commandment does not make you to be a holy person. It's by allowing the grace of God to live in your life. So for this rich young ruler, his was about ticking and, and, and making himself to be perfect before God because he has kept certain commandments in his life. But the spirit of the commandments of God was not in his life. So it's very much important for us as God's people. As we count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, we need to spend time in the word of God. And when, it's time, when we spend time with the word of God, then we will know the will of God in our lives. We'll know what God expects for each and every one of us with whatever circumstances that we face in our lives. And that's why Jesus Christ said in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus called his people that whoever wants to be his disciple, and that brings to the third item, you need to deny yourself. You need to deny yourself. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, and the Bible says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If we can't deny ourselves, it will be very difficult to follow Jesus Christ. It will be difficult to follow Jesus Christ. Because we are living in the world, and the influence of the world is all much around us. We need to deny ourselves the things of the world. We need to deny ourselves the pleasures of the world. And when we do so, it gives us an opportunity to have more time to contemplate upon the word of God. It gives us more time to focus what is God telling us. And in denying yourself by following Jesus Christ, you will have to take up the cross. It will not be an easy path. It will not be an easy road when you deny yourself because there will be a cross which you will be bearing. People will not love the decision that you have made because you have decided to deny yourself and follow Jesus Christ. Many will be against you. Many will forsake you because you have denied yourself. And that's why this rich young ruler was not ready to sell his property because whatever he had acquired defined him. It's like Jesus Christ was telling him to forsake the leadership responsibility that he had because this young man was a ruler. And to find a young person who's a ruler, it's an achievement in life. And he was not ready to relinquish the position that he had acquired as a ruler. And so when Christ is telling him, go and sell all that you have, Christ was simply telling him that you, you step down from that position. But he was not ready. It was difficult for him 
to take up that cross and above all to live like somebody who doesn't have anything, to live without having people attending to your needs and to your care. It was difficult for this young person to do so. And that's why it was hard for him to follow Jesus Christ. What things do you need to deny yourself of the things of the world? Those things which becomes an idol in your life, because it has taken that time that you need to praise God, that time that you need to worship God, that time that you need to spend with God in becoming his disciple, in becoming his follower. So if we can't deny God, if we can't deny ourselves, then we'll not be able to be in a position to serve God. And so Christ told this young man, after you have sold all that you have, follow me. For you to be a disciple... You have to repent and believe in the gospel. You have to accept that the life that you have lived in the past is in a, against the will of God. And by accepting the gospel and living in the gospel, you set yourself free. You become at liberty to do the will of God. And that becomes denying yourself of the things of the world so that you can be free to serve God. When you look at the book of John chapter 12, John chapter 12, verse 26. We have been called to serve God. And that's the, third, the fourth item. Whereby, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be ready to serve God. And in serving God, what does the Bible say? The book of John chapter 12, verse 36. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. If you want to serve God, then you need to follow Jesus. You need to follow Jesus in order to serve who? God. And in order to serve, to follow Jesus, you need to repent of your sins and believe in the word of God. And let the, the word of God be the rule of your life. And the last item, to become a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to deny yourself the things that separate us with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then you become free to serve Jesus Christ. You become free to serve God. You become free to serve in the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that if anyone serve God, wherever he is, there God is. That means that the presence of God will always walk with you. It's a good thing to always to walk with God. And that's why Jesus Christ, when he commanded his disciples in Matthew, in Matthew 28, verse 19, he told them that I'm commanding you to go and preach in the entire world. Go and make more to be my disciples. And he gave them a promise, I will be with you till the end of the age. That's a promise which has been given to God's servant that the presence of Jesus Christ will always accompany them. And when the presence of the Lord is always with them, they will never need, they will never want because the Lord will be their provider. The Lord will be their sustainer. Sometimes we live in a world whereby we are constantly wanting, we are constantly desiring for things, basically because we are not serving God. And God is looking for people who will be able to serve him, who will render their talents, who will render their gifts, who will render their opportunity and their influence for his service. And it's when you, when you render your gifts, your opportunity, your influence for the service of the Lord, the Lord is giving an assurance that wherever his servant is, he's always there with him. Sometimes maybe you've looked for that promotion but you're not getting it. You never know. Maybe because you don't want to serve in the house of God and that's why you have not got that promotion. There's, some, there's a favor that you want to be done to you, but because you have not served in the house of God, you're not serving in God's work, God is not sustaining you. God is not providing you. But the Lord is looking for people who will be able to serve him who will be able to be in his service. It doesn't matter. You don't need to be a preacher in order to serve God. But in whatever capacity that the Lord has blessed you, with whichever talent and your influence, the Lord will be able to bless 
you wherever you are. Because wherever you are serving God, that's where God will meet you. That's where God will bless you. Because wherever you are as his servant while serving him, the presence of the Lord will always accompany you. So it's very much important that when we serve God, we honor our Father in heaven. So you don't need to be a preacher in order to serve God. You just need to love God with all your heart that you can be able to put all your influence, your blessings, your gift, your knowledge, and whatever God has given to you, uh, God has given to you for his service. And when you do so, you become his disciple. And when you are his disciple, the Lord meets you where you are serving him. The Lord reaches out to where you are in order to continue blessing your ministry, in order to continue blessing your influence so that you can be able to reach to many other people and expound your boundaries and your territories. Because it's the purpose of the Lord to bless you. When he entered into a covenant with his servant Abraham, he said that all those who are the descendants of Abraham will be called, will be blessed. And so sometimes we turn away from the blessings of God because we think that when we serve God, when we, when we are in the service of God, we are just expanding ourselves. But in that quest, in that process, the blessings of God continue to flow in our lives, continue to trickle down to us. But when you don't put our influence in the service of the Lord, but when you don't put our gifts in the service of the Lord, when you don't put our resources in the service of the Lord, the Lord will not meet us there. And the blessings of God will not be upon us. So the Lord is looking forward to bless his men servants. He's looking forward to be with them in the service. That they may experience his love and his joy in their lives. It's only calling us Our love for our God may be greater, that we may commit our life for the service of God, and we may love him. So the question that you are being asked today, where is our love? Is our love in the things of the world, or our love is for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? The choice is ours. I, it's my prayer and hope that each and every one of us will choose Jesus Christ, that we may dedicate our life for his service. May God bless you and help you to make the right decision. Above all, to count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you because of Jesus Christ. He has called each and every one of us to be his follower. Sometimes we have not counted the cost. Help us that we may count the cost of following Jesus and forevermore love Jesus and walk with him in his service. Be with each and every one of us now and forevermore in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen.